Welcome to the Flawed Workshop Podcast with me, your host, Nancy Art Music. And me, your co-host, Alex Roberts. This week, we're speaking with Blake Bennett. He's an amazing music composer and a fantastic human being with some wonderful advice about making music, collaborating with others, what kind of gear to get, all sorts of wonderful things to do with the music industry. This conversation in particular was absolutely amazing for me as somebody who's been struggling with all sorts of creative blocks when it comes to making music. Blake is joining us all the way from Australia, which meant that there was quite a significant time difference when we could schedule this, meaning that unfortunately Alex couldn't join us and this is just a conversation between Blake and I but I hope you enjoy it nonetheless and uh, I would like to also take this moment to ask you to please follow subscribe and rate and review the podcast wherever you're listening to it it would mean a huge amount to us to get your feedback but without further ado let's get on with the show thank you for joining me on the flawed workshop podcast uh we're in two very different time zones. It is around 11 p.m. for me and uh, around 8 a.m. for you. But I'm here with uh, Blake. Please uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do. Hi. It's great to be here. I'm Blake. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, and I'm a composer. So I write I Woo! write music. Mm -hmm. um, and um, is that more, I think, uh, I knew about your work a little bit, but not a huge amount. Uh, I think we we didn't really get a lot of time to discuss it when we were uh, working together previously. But I know that, well, I think I know it's for film. But yeah, elaborate a little bit and tell me kind of a little bit more about that. Well, yeah, it's, I mean, I, com I compose mostly um, orchestral music. But, you know, I dabble in a, in a few other things like electronic and uh, jazz and contemporary, that sort of thing. But uh, mostly, I would say my strength is in uh, composition um, for orchestra. Mm. Um, in terms of what medium, um, mostly it's been TV and advertising. Uh, I would love to do. I did. I did some short films and things, which I I, I did enjoy that format. Um, but the industry that I'm really trying to that I'd really like to crack into is um, interactive media, so video games and Ooh, stuff like nice. that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've I've done some t stuff in the early days doing uh, doing some TV work. I got pretty lucky with making a contact here in Australia. Um, it was an old friend of my dad's. It's always, it's always just who you know, isn't it? Yep. Yep. Um, so I ended up doing some work and it was for like those reality shows, um, like my kitchen rules and, um, over here they have a show called the block, which is like a renovation show. They love reality TV here. Oh yeah. Um, some of the, you know, you, I, I think some of the best reality TV that I've seen is from Australia. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hear that everybody's very into maths at the moment over there. Oh, you guys don't call it maths too. It's married at first sight. Oh yeah. Well, I, I'm generally not a very big reality TV watcher. Um, but I, but I have to admit it, <laughs> It, it it makes me very curious because you see clips of it that go viral every now and then, and it's like, oh my yeah. god, this is real life for people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually don't watch it myself. <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, so I I didn't do any of the I wasn't involved in any of the music with um, Married at First Sight, but yeah, um, yeah, My Kitchen Rules, The Block. I think there was another show called The Force, which was like a Border Force kind of show or a police force show. I'm not really mm. sure. Um, so I did, I did do that. That was in Australia. And then um, more of the advertising stuff was while I was, whilst I was in London. Nice. And um, if we, uh, I guess, rewind a whole bunch, uh, how did you first get involved in music? I mean, I feel like for everybody that I've spoken to and certainly myself, it's always as a kid, I really liked being creative. So I'm assuming yeah. it's the same for you, but uh, you can tell me if that's right. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that that tracks. Well, I mean, I was really into playing with Lego when I was a kid. That's, that's <laughs> probably the first sign that uh, I was creative. Uh, I, I never really, I never really enjoyed building things to the instructions. I always wanted to just get yes. that out of the way so that I could throw it into the big box of Lego and then make whatever, whatever I wanted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I have um, to admit, I felt the same way, and I felt like a genius anytime I made something that was that seemed structurally <laughs> sound, but I yeah. created. <laughs> Yeah, I think before that I was playing with something called Mobolo. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Mm. It's like the it's like the yellow. They look like little yellow rods that are all together in like different shapes, and then you got these little red connectors mm. and wheels and stuff. So yeah, it's lots of fun to play with if you're if you're a kid or you have kids. Look at Mobolo. Mm-hmm. I imagine there's probably not very many five year olds listening to this, but you know. <laughs> Every now and then, plug, I'm sure there's a parent out there. Mobolo. Out there somewhere, maybe <laughs> listening to this podcast yeah. with their kid in the back seat. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Could be. yeah, um, their, their main problem is they don't have any income, so that is uh, a problem. Really, yes, <laughs> really struggle <laughs> with making purchase choices. <laughs> um, oh. So, but my my um, my musical background, my my family is very musical. So mm. my dad, my dad was a drummer, mm. and uh, so was my pop. Um, Laurie Bennett was, was my pop's name. He, um, he played with a few big names back in the, way back in the day, like Liza Minnelli and, uh, Cliff Richards. Um, nice. I, I, I can't remember. He did some, he did some like random things where he just, he would, he would fill, he'd just be the, the extra drummer or he would fill in or he was a drummer for hire. Basically that was his, that was his mm. deal. But, uh, yeah, he was prolific during like the seventies and eighties and stuff on the jazz scene. So. That was during a time when there was a lot more uh, live music, especially around Sydney here. Mm-hmm. Um, and then my great uncle was a composer, and my great grandfather was a piano player. My great great friend. There's, there's, it's kind of inescapable, almost. Yeah, <laughs> that, lots that, of family that, influences that seeped in. Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, then I, um, I actually asked my parents for piano lessons mm. when I was eight because they, they weren't really pushing anything. But I was like eight and I said, I really want to play the piano. Can I have lessons? <laughs> so they're like, yeah, sure. Yeah, you can have lessons. Yeah, yeah. So they sent me off to lessons. And that was probably the, that was probably my first exposure to like learning music properly. Mm. Um, although there was always a drum kit set up so I'd bash around on it like, yeah. you know, from the age of two. But <laughs> there's nothing to write <laughs> home about. <laughs> Oh. Uh, yeah, there's some pretty hilarious old home videos of me just Ding. <laughs> bang. Yeah. I love. Uh, I, I just love watching. It's always so interesting. It sounds like a really strange uh, kind of rabbit hole on the internet. Just watching young children play instruments because obviously mobility is not like the best. Oh. <laughs> uh, y- but yeah. every now and then something sounds really good and you're like, oh, my God, are they secretly a prodigy? <laughs> uh, and occasionally you do, you do, you find someone that really makes you feel bad about yourself. Oh, God, yeah. yeah. Oh, my God, they're f- like six and they play better than me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's truly, there's a, um, the, I, I don't remember her name, but uh, this girl and Dave Grohl have like a drum battle uh, that they have online. They exchange like songs and stuff and they they properly have it out with like making songs at each other and they're now like it's it's just so much fun to watch um and and very difficult not to be jealous (laughs) of young kids basically i know that are super talented yeah yeah there's this there's this one kid on uh instagram that um that i that i've followed his name is justin lee schultz i think it's s-c-h-a-l-t-z or s i can remember um and he's just insane on he plays a, he plays a keyboard he plays the drums i think uh, and he sings he's very very good mm. um yeah, anybody who's interested in in seeing like child prodigies playing the in- musical instruments he's definitely one to keep an eye on mm. i think his sister plays the drums too and they have like a band together it's pretty oh, cool so cute yeah, so cute i don't know how old he is now he's probably like 9 or 10 or something mm. yeah um but I actually didn't think that I was going to get into music until the end of high school. Mm. So I was in, when I was going through high school, I, for some reason I had this idea in my head that I wanted to be an engineer. Um, Makes sense with the Lego. Yeah, yeah. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so I did, uh, when I got to like senior, like the, the last two years of high school, you know, you get to kind of choose your direction a little bit and like pick some subjects. I don't know mm. if it's the same over there, but. I ended up choosing like all the sciences 
extension maths, extension <laughs> English, all the really difficult subjects because I was focused on getting a high A. Uh, here we have a ranking system. Uh, I call it an ATAR, here, mm. A-T-A-R. Um, that's like your ranking to like help you get into universities and stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think it was the first week. Oh, yeah, there was another one called Eng- Engineering Studies as well. And that was within the first week of that year, that first year, I completely freaked out. Oh, no. <laughs> I completely freaked out because I was like, what am I doing with my life? This is not what I want to do. This is not my direction. I don't know what triggered mm. it. Um, I had done some uh, work experience at like an engineering firm and found it really, really boring. Mm. Um, so maybe that was playing on my mind at the time. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I completely freaked out. And I and I and I went to my to my teacher, um, the one that does the like careers stuff, and mm. and and talked about how I was feeling, and. Uh, I decided to pretty much change all my subjects to creative subjects almost. I kept the extension in maths. Um, I kind of wish I had kept like some of the science just because I do really like science. Mm. But at the moment, at the time, I was just like, no, I have to move away from this. I need to be something different. Yeah. And so I went and I, t- I, did, uh, I did drama. Uh, I did entertainment, which is like uh, live performance, like lighting and sound and all that. <gasps> I and wish we had that at my school. That sounds yeah. awesome. It was pretty good, um, and and I did then I and I picked up music and uh, design technology, which was like just a, des- uh, a design class, and so everything was creative. And then all mm. of a sudden, I had all these subjects that had major projects at the end. <laughs> oh God, yeah. yeah, I can of course because stuff like that gets graded on. Yeah, all you can't major take stuff. an you can't take an exam in some of these things. Which, I mean, I don't know. I found that to be quite good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, just the fact that you learn something over an entire year only to have it boiled down to two hours of your entire life is whew, not for yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's, <laughs> that's a fair point. That's a mm. fair point. I think it was just a lot of extra out-of-hours out of school work that I had to do. Yes. Yeah. M- much like in real life in some ways. Yeah. <laughs> much, much like that. Yeah, it's pre- perhaps it prepared me well. Mm. <laughs> um, so, but then I was doing music and we had some composition uh, assignments and exams and stuff. And I always found that I was doing really well with them. And I really enjoyed the process, mm. um, like really well. And I thought, oh, I wonder if I could maybe do something with this. And, you know, I talked to the teacher and he, you know, explained that, you know, there, this is this is uh, the path that some people do take. And it is possible. It's just a very challenging, you know, career to to choose, especially in Australia. Mm-hmm. Um, and I went okay, and then just like in that moment, I just decided that was that was that was what I was going to do. Mm. Okay, I'm I'm going to write music. I'm going to write music for video games, and that's that's where I'm going to go. That's really cool. Um, I mean, it's it's nice that you you can kind of connect the dots i feel uh with some of the people that i've been talking to it, it almost sometimes comes as a surprise they're like all of a sudden i'm doing this <laughs> yeah <laughs> so yeah yeah that was the that was when i first started purchasing you know like a sound uh sound card like an audio interface mm. and uh some of my dad's friends were able to advise me on what i needed yeah to get started but it was very ghetto when i started mm. out I had like some old, old bookshelf speakers from the 80s <laughs> wired up to an old uh, car stereo amp. Oh, wow. Amplifier. So I had, I had, I had that to answer, like to pack, because they were passive speakers. So there was no mm. power in them. There was just like speaker cable. Yeah. And so I had that wired up to an old car amplifier. And then the output of that went, um, like, or the input, sorry, came from the, se- the, the sound card. So mm-hmm. I went out of the sound card and then <laughs> into this ghetto oh, car amplifier. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? It was okay. Like it didn't it didn't it didn't uh it didn't go too bad and it cost me basically like nothing. I think I got the thing the amplifier for like I don't know, like fifteen dollars on eBay. Mm-hmm. Um the most expensive part was probably the sound card, which I kept for a long time. Mm-hmm. I think I kept that for like I kept that for like eight years and I used that sound card 
So wow. it was a good it was a good investment for like two hundred bucks. Yeah, not bad. Like per day, the cost goes down every day you use it. Basically, yeah, yeah, oh, that's wow. right. No, it's really it's like uh, to be fair with stuff like that. I feel like it's always a pain to kind of mishmash and Frankenstein all the bits together. But when you finally have it working, if it works, it, it's just fine. You probably don't need to yeah. change it for quite a while. Oh, yeah, man. a lot, a lot, a lot of people get really um, concerned about you know having the best gear, mm-hmm. um, and the best gear is uh, really the the gear that you're used to, like the tool that you've used a lot and that you know the sound of it. Yeah. Um, so like you can you can mix on you can mix on headphones. Like you need to you need to check things on stereo systems for panning and like spaciousness. Um, mm. But you you can if you've got a like a decent set of headphones that you've been using for ten years, you'd probably be pretty good at mixing on those. Yeah, I would imagine because so I feel like you've it, got a good sound reference. You know what stuff yeah. sounds like in them. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and those 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 speakers. I think I used that setup when I was doing the TV stuff. Oh wow! Yeah, no, I did professional work with that. That's perfect. Equipment can be such a big hang up for people when they're mm-hmm. trying to get started and a lot of people kind of wait and wait and wait until they have the right gear, whatever that is, rather than mm. using simply what they have. Um, yeah. And there's, I mean, personally, I, I really understand that because I was one of those people <laughs> and it took me a while yeah. to just realize that if there are people that are doing things with a lot less, but they're successful, then surely all you need to do is just start putting in time. Yeah, that's right. And, um, Feeling like you're not ready, I definitely, I definitely suffered from that for, for quite a while. Like I, I'm not, I'm, you know, my sound is not polished yet. You know, I'm mm-hmm. not, I'm not ready to go put myself out there. And you know, that's true to an extent, um, because you don't, you don't want to be, you know, hounding the same people over and over. You know, every time you make something slightly better, yeah, uh, you want to have it to a different, a, a decent level but if you've got some people that you that you trust that will give you you know uh honest feedback honest feedback is very very useful Mm. um if they're telling you you know this is good yeah then try something do something with it Mm -hmm. yeah and i think it's uh finding people who are willing to give you feedback is uh kind of scary in itself I, uh, I don't know if you uh, ever had experienced anything like this whenever I make any work of any kind especially music not so much with my like drawings and stuff um, but whenever I make music it always I feel like it completely sounds different when you actually play it in front of somebody else and you all of a sudden hear all the tiny little mistakes that you didn't notice, all the things yeah. that subconsciously were living in the back of your head that you didn't know were there until you, somebody else has ears on it. Um, yeah. Did you ever find uh, kind of the same thing with your work? Yeah, absolutely. If I was playing, if I was present whilst <laughs> I was playing something for someone else to listen to, I would just be a giant ball of anxiety going, oh, it's terrible. Why would I even do it? I'd almost be tempted to interrupt and be like, "Don't worry about that. It's not finished. That bit's not finished." Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and just and just ruin the listening experience for them. Mm-hmm. I I tend to uh, just send a link so that mm-hmm. I'm not there. Be like, here, go yeah, listen to this. What do you think? Because then they're listening to it on their own sound system that they're used to. And you're not there, and you can't. And I'm not there. <laughs> live over their shoulder and be like, "Oh, sorry, that note was a little off, and the timing yeah. for that wasn't quite right." It's, oh, that was just a bit. Oh, I, mean, I need to fix that. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you know my sort of history with music in general. I've always wanted to be a musician. Literally, oh. I think I, I when I, when I was six years old, I decided that that's what I was going to do with my life. I was going to be a singer like Whitney Houston and Beyonce and Celine Dion and whoever else. And um, <laughs> I was very determined to make that happen. And uh, all the way up to doing my bachelor's in music and sound technology because. Yeah. I was like, I have, I have the skill. Um, 
or no, sorry. At that time, I was very in my own head and very egotistical. And so I, was mm. like, I have the talent um, to <laughs> sing and be, you know, fantastic as a performer. And so I don't need to study that. What I need to study is music and sound production, because, of course, I want to be in control of everything. And okay. <laughs> what happened was that <laughs> I basically paralyzed myself into not making any music. And I actually haven't made anything um I haven't made a completed work of any kind since I was 14 for sure. Oh, I wow. made I it's been a while. <laughs> and oh, then um I think I wrote two songs that were I had to do for grade um cuz I took a songwriting module. Um yeah. But I didn't like them. I hated them. Um they still make me feel like unsettled. Um, uh, yeah, but it's, they can. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, ooh, what I'm hoping is actually this podcast, this entire thing is a big scam to try and get myself into <laughs> making music again <laughs> <laughs> and getting advice from people as much as I can. But, um, that's, uh, I feel like uh-huh. that it started with that paralysis of showing music to other people. Um, and it, it can be just very detrimental, but um yeah so i'm trying to learn from uh people who are just making music and uh i guess mm. practicing it every day so how um how do you how do you practice music how oh, how do i practice music um at the moment i've been very um separated from my music i've got i've got another project going on that is uh really taking up quite a lot of time and so i'm feeling i'm feeling the the disconnect at the moment from mm. my music because I, I don't have the um i don't have the setup to be able to sit down and write um i haven't got the outlet to you know to sit down and write music just because i've i've moved from london back home mm-hmm. and that was a whole uh huge ordeal and uh which I'm sure we'll get to. Um, yeah. And how do I practice music? Well, before I I made that move and I I was um, just over there in London. Um, just playing was is a good is a good thing to do. Just playing with sounds that you like the sound of. Mm. Um, you, if you have a if you if you enjoy playing the keyboard or something like that, or if you have a uh, a, a musical toy of some kind, like for instance, I've got um, a couple of C boards. Mm. They're uh, they're like a squishy kind of keyboard, and Ooh. they 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 sort of react to pressure. So that you, you know, as you press, I think I brought it. I think you may have seen it once in the um, past. I don't. No? What I don't know. Don't remember if it's like in the shape of a keyboard. What I'm picturing is those um, like uh, half note shaped things that you squeeze and they make like a sound as you slide your finger up and down it i don't know what that's called either (laughs) no me neither no um it's it looks like a keyboard it's like a black like i have actually they're right in front of me however because i don't have a microphone stand at the moment they're propping up my microphone that's fine (laughs) i I can google it afterwards yeah 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 they look like a little keyboard like a black um, squishy kind of material, and and as you press your finger into a into one of the keys, it reacts to pressure. So mm-hmm. the f- so you can um, you know get sustained notes. So you can press your finger down, and it gets louder. And mm-hmm. as you pull your finger off, it gets softer. But you can you can control that just with your finger. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it reacts to sliding up and down, so it changes the pitch. Ooh, is it um, actually the um. It's making me think of, I don't know if it's a Novation product, but it's like that really fancy MIDI keyboard and it's like super expensive as well. But if you're if I, you're putting it in the context of a toy, that can't be it, is it? Well, well to me it feels like a toy because I love playing with it. Um, oh, fair enough. But I do, I do actually use it regularly as a tool. Um, but it was, what was it? It was like 299, pounds. Yeah, that, I think that's it, what that was. Worth, I think but, uh, I think it's yeah, I think that's it. Is it because uh, I think you can program sounds onto it, like you can put samples into it, and it can 
also just be a regular piano kind of thing if you wanted it to be? It's it's kind of well, you don't put any. It's purely a MIDI controller. You can't put mm. any sounds in. Like you, it just plays whatever sounds you mm, have mm. loaded up on on your computer. Yeah. Um, but there are software that it can use so that you know you can really take advantage of all the different things that you can do with it mm. playing that i've tried playing like regular piano on it and it doesn't feel right <laughs> so i don't really i don't really like playing the piano on it i have a i have a full weighted keyboard for, yeah. for that which which i haven't got set up which is why i'm uh, which is why i haven't really done anything uh, for a little while um i'm just making excuses for myself really but um well that's i could set the- it up i could set it up but <laughs> I, I just i haven't Well, that's kind of one of the things that I was struggling with, like that I'm still struggling with, (laughs) because I, uh, I've, uh, I, like speaking of the entire equipment thing, uh, I just kept kind of adding bits and pieces. I got like KRKs, uh, like monitors for. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh god, I love like first of all, they're just beautiful. Like they're pretty. The black and yellow looks really gorgeous. (laughs) But um. And then I was like, oh, okay, I've got my studio monitor. I've got my, you know, focus right interface. I've got the microphone that came with it. Hmm. Mm-hmm. But I need a keyboard. So I went out and got one. Um, and I think yeah. uh, that, what was the last piece of equipment I bought? I bought an uh, electric drum kit because I was going <laughs> to, I really went for it. And, mm. and then I bought a violin. Like an electric violin, <laughs> it was it was truly crazy. Um, Are you waiting to have like the full orchestra? I think just that's in what, your room. <laughs> potentially, yeah. I think that's what I was waiting for because I was. I think I'm like generally. I know this about myself that I'm a control freak, and so mm-hmm. in my head, it would have been better for me to be jack of all trades in the worst possible way for each of my creations, <laughs> um, instead of kind of mastering one thing and maybe getting help from other people because <laughs> I yeah. <laughs> the control, um, the control freak thing. Um, the like equipment thing and showing it to other people that was all of that was uh, kind of holding me back. And I'm, I'm doing my, I like, I, I really, really miss making music. And now I'm at the point where I have to, like, I'm facing these giant walls and I'm trying to just punch them down, but I don't know how to do it. And I'm like, my fist will hurt. I don't want to punch uh-huh. it. Maybe I can walk around it. Should I climb it? And just these questions are sitting in my head and they're bugging me. Um, you know, something that I found uh, really, really good to do, um, and it depends on the, the person that you do it with, but uh, collaborating mm. on something where you kind of have to hand over some of that control to another person and that yeah. it just yet forces you to kind of be – because uh, it's either if you if you don't, then it's not going to work, and you're going to you know <laughs> ruin that p- friendship potentially. So yes. there's a very strong incentive for you to go. Okay, I'll let you. I'll let you look after that. So I um I I did some collaborations with my friend um who I also met working working for Bose. Woo-hoo. Um, but but in Australia, yeah, his name's Jordan Leonard. He's a very good um producer. So if mm. you're a singer and you're looking for a producer. Jordan Leonard is the man. Nice. Um, he's he's really really good. And working with him on some, we did some library music together. Mm. Um, and we just sat, we were just I was sat next to him in the studio, and he kind of had I was at his studio, so he had control of you know what what was happening. Um, and there was there was a lot of anxiety in just handing that control, but he was really receptive and responsive to all the suggestions and all the things that I was saying, what we were, yeah. what we were trying to achieve. And I guess because we were on the same level, you know, most of the time, um, that worked really well. Something that I learned from that experience was uh, how to finish a project. Because yeah. I would I would work on something for such a, like for a long time, um, or something that I struggled with. And um, we get to the point where I'm just making changes for the sake of making changes. Mm -hmm. Uh, And you you get to a point where you've listened to the same thing so many times that it sounds bad to you. Yeah. Because it's annoying to hear. Yes. (laughs) For like the the thousandth (laughs) time. Uh, And then you go, oh, I'm I'm just going to change this bit here. And then that sort of freshens up the sound to your ears. Yeah. And you go, oh, well, that's better. But to somebody else, they'll listen to those two versions and go, they're both good. They they sound both just as good. Yeah. You I could have been finished with it a week ago. 
Mm. Um, so, but by working with Jordan, every time I would make a, I would say, "Hey, do you think we should maybe change something with, with that?" Bit? He would say, "No." <laughs> that is so good. Somebody to set a boundary. Yeah. No, we shouldn't. I like it, and I'd go, "Oh, okay." Do you? Okay, oh, that's nice because he was very positive. Mm. And we finished a track really, really quickly. Like we finished a track in like a, a couple of evenings, and it would be like a full, full library track. Mm. Um, pr- produced, mixed, like done. Um, and I was like, wow. And you know what? I feel good about this. Cause I listened back to the finished product. Cause sometimes you're making changes before it's finished and you, yeah. you, you know, you don't hear the journey of the melody that you've written in the harmony and how it resolves and blah, blah, blah. So you'd be like changing elements of it before you've got to that point. So his whole thing was let's get to the end and mm. like feel it out and then go back and like, Listen over and see how that works. Because the, there was things where I was like, oh, that's that's terrible. I'm, that's We should change that. And he'd be like, no, 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 no. Just, just wait until we've got to the end and mm-hmm. then let's hear it. And most of the time we'd play back the whole thing and go, you know what? In context, that's actually pretty good. I like that. That works. That's and really was, good. It, and because it was library music, um, it wasn't, you know, for a brief, for a, you know, like an ad where somebody else had to approve um and be really particular about it they it was just sending to a producer to have a listen to and go yeah no i like that that's that's vaguely the that's kind of the the vibe we were going for with this album so Mm. i think that helped as well the suggestion would be to find somebody that you might like to collaborate with yeah might be a good a good way to kind of get out of your comfort zone and make something happen let me ask this before i forget what's library music Okay, yeah, I've had to explain this to a few people. Library music is like stock music, you know, like stock photo- stock photos. Oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, so you just go to a website and it's pre-made, pre-written music that is designed to be um, used in a production. It's often also referred to as production music. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Um, but some people get confused with that term as well. Um, yeah, that's fine. Like, no, I, yeah, yeah, I'm a producer, so that's what I do. But there you go, oh, no, you you – you work on pop music. So the mm-hmm. vague the terms in the music industry are very vague and interchangeable. Yeah, I find the same thing with uh, I was talking to a friend uh, about this in the film industry and just the random words that people come up with in terms of uh, like for terminology are, is quite interesting <laughs> where they all come from and everything. But yeah, in terms of like my attempts to leave my comfort zone, uh I think I've only really tried to do it twice, but the situations I'll, it's very difficult when I'm in my own head about this to figure out whether these are excuses that I've put for myself or whether they're legitimate reasons that this didn't work. Um, yeah. So am I in my own way or was this actually not beneficial? But <laughs> um, I joined um, a band, I think it was just before the like pandemic. Um, mm-hmm. So I, probably just before the end of 2019 or just like the somewhere around there. And mm. it was from an ad on Gumtree. Yeah, I uh, was kind of doing a reverse search where instead of singer looking for band, band looking for singer, because then I feel like search terms wise, that makes way more sense. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I found this band and they were like, we love Led Zeppelin and Green Day. I hope they, um, I wonder if they'll ever listen to this. But I think it, it's no secret because we all kind of disbanded. I don't think we were very good. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> the um, the songwriting was not my style, uh, but I think each of us individually had our own talents just together. It like didn't really make that much sense. Um, and I think maybe if some of us were like paired off, we would have very interesting projects, but all of us together probably didn't make a huge amount of sense. And uh I, I kind of wondered, I was like, maybe I should have stuck with it, even though I felt that, even though I felt everything we were making was terrible, um, <laughs> maybe I should have stuck through, uh, stuck through it all because I was having fun. Um. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that, uh, well, I mean, I'm not a singer, but f- when I went to university, what seemed to be um, the case was that singers had to stick with what they liked a lot more than say a guitarist because it was more obvious 
that yeah. they weren't super into the thing that they were singing. You know, you had to you had to be both a really good singer and a really good actor if you were going to be doing yes <laughs> music that you that you weren't into. So it was just <laughs> the, the, I think the general advice from all the lecturers or the teachers for the singers was stick to uh, music that uh, you like. Yeah. Because otherwise it's not going to sound like it's going to be obvious in the sound. That was uh, definitely definitely the the case for me. But at the same time, I didn't want to seem like I hadn't been in a band before. I think the mm. last time I, well, I had uh, been in one at school when I was like 15, but I was like, it's been more than a decade since that. So I, you know, I should be collaborative and, you know, I'm, I'm happy. This is to help me, you know, spark my creativity and restart my journey with music. So I shouldn't be very picky. I'm just going to go with it. And so I was very accepting um, of everything that was kind of going on. I, I tried to collaborate with Alex, my boyfriend, my fiance. Yeah. Um, yep. And mm-hmm. he, again, brilliant bassist, but I, I think because we're also in a relationship together and I think we know each other very well, I kind of expect him to read my mind more. So when he wasn't playing what I wanted, I got even more frustrated. That's mm. So I decided we can't work together and that's <laughs> fine. <laughs> um, so finding the correct people to collaborate with is... Uh, I'm going to take that suggestion on board, <laughs> basically. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other, I mean, the other way that you could uh, involve other people is do it using something like Fiverr. So if you like mm. wrote a, a bit mm. and like sent it to someone to to be like, "Hey, is this playable? Can can you play this? What's 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 the deal?" Because some some people are uh, are on there that are really cheap, and mm. it doesn't necessarily have to even be like. Rec- uh, recording quality, just be like, you know, yeah, I've got this violin part. I know you have a violin now, but you know, <laughs> if you send it, but send it to somebody who has spent ten years practicing it, say, so, eh, is this possible? Have I written something that's not playable? Yeah. What What does it What does it sound like? Mm. I've seen people uh, just request, like, like they send clips over and they say, "This is what I've done. I'd like some strings on it. I don't know." anything about how to write strings so you go for it and it al- almost always turns out really good um yeah. to me but obviously i don't know what the person who's requesting it wanted in some ways cuz i feel like well for me I, when i write music sometimes i hear everything simultaneously and i feel like i have a finished product in my head but getting it mm. out is really annoying because obviously i don't have the skill to do it and if I mm. try and direct somebody else to do it, I just sound like a horrible person because everything they're doing isn't quite like it sounds like in my head, which is imaginary. Mm. So it's not really yeah. fair. <laughs> yeah. Com- trying to communicate your ideas is, is a skill in and of itself. Mm. Um, and also interpreting directions from other people is a skill as well yes. very much because you could be a, you could be really good at communicating your ideas but if you're talking to someone who's really bad at interpreting directions or <laughs> taking direction then it's still not going to work so yeah but at least with fiverr there's a lot of people out there and you only spend 5 bucks so yeah it's not the end of the it's not the end. and you don't have a personal connection with them if it's like no good you go cool thank True. you I'll yep. uh, I'll, uh, I'll try someone else yeah it might even be worth being like okay let's get 3 string players and Mm -hmm. I'll send the same thing to each of them and just see what comes back you know I guess that's also a fun experiment because then you can figure out how other people like if you get three completely different things it's an interesting exercise in creativity um yeah and it's also good for uh I guess helping fund musicians uh around the world with you know their passion and stuff like Mm. that yeah, it doesn't cost you that much money to do it. You know, they make a little bit of money doing it. Uh, it's good for everybody. Yeah. Well, speaking of around the world, um, mm. you uh, mentioned earlier, and obviously I know from how we met, that you uh, basically moved to London for a little bit to pursue uh, your composition, basically. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about that? Yep, absolutely. Um, I was feeling a little bit stuck. With where I was here in Sydney, um, the industry isn't that big. You know, most people who are in it know each other 
Um, and even though I kind of had that little foot in the door with the TV stuff, it, w- it wasn't really enough because the way that it was, the way that it worked was, um, I didn't, re- I didn't get a credit on anything. Mm. Um, I was working, I was working directly for another composer. I mean, I'm, I'm still grateful for the, for the opportunity, but, um, yeah. you know, I, I could put down on my website or whatever that I've done, you know, music for this, but there was no proof or evidence to be like, see, there's my name. That's me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> um, uh, so I was just feeling a little bit stuck and uh, I had actually kind of moved away from music for a bit. There was this whole issue where um, I had a, I had a really long term relationship that was uh, like seven years or so mm. um, from, from age 16. So that was like, you know, my first girlfriend as well uh, that ended. Mm. Um, and that was quite a painful thing to go through. And I just, I just stopped doing music for like, uh, a year or yeah I think it was like a year I, st- I just completely stopped but I traveled mm. um and I got a job at Bose that was the first that was when I got that job there and I was like okay I'm just gonna get a full-time job until I figure out what I'm doing yeah um and you know I met a few people who worked at Bose who like Jordan um who also do music and I just uh, inevitably got drawn back to you know, writing music. And, uh, I made, uh, a very fortuitous connection. Mm. Um, my dad was selling his wardrobe on Gumtree. <laughs> oh, Gumtree. I yeah. mean, I feel like yeah. I should get them as a sponsor for the podcast. Now. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, uh, my dad was selling his wardrobe on Gumtree and, um, this guy was going to come and pick it up. And my dad was basically telling him that, you know, he's not at home, but, you know, my son is at home. Um, uh, but just give me a call if you don't hear an answer because my son is a composer, so he might have his headphones on and he might not hear the door. Yeah. Uh, and he was like, oh, your son is a composer. Oh, okay, cool. Maybe I should maybe I should have a chat with him. My dad was texted me like, uh, this guy is coming to buy the wardrobe. Uh, he says he wants to chat with you. I don't know. <laughs> um, I, uh, I was... I was doing some, uh, this was, this was before bows and everything, by the mm. way, this, this have to have to get the timeline, right? This was when I was doing the TV stuff. Uh, so I happened to be working on something and all that, all that TV stuff's very dramatic sounding music. Like if you listen to the music on its own, it sounds like an epic score. <laughs> uh, <laughs> cause that's just what drives the, that's what drives the whole thing. Yeah. Um, but so it was, it was some pretty good stuff that I was, that I was working on and he came to pick up the um the wardrobe and he was like oh, i hear you're a composer have you got anything that you're working on i was like yeah sure why don't you come on in and i'll, I'll play what i'm working on and that was what i was working on currently i was like yeah this is for tv this is what i'm doing mm. he was like that was really good um here's my card and it was said general manager of universal music um and i went whoa okay <laughs> whoa that is a fortuitous connection <laughs> okay yeah yeah um and he was buying the wardrobe. It was like an old fashioned gentleman's wardrobe. He was buying the wardrobe for a music video that they were making. Mm. Um, I can't remember the name of the music video. Ah, oh, I can't remember. Um, but yeah, so he gave me his card and was like, we'll be in touch. And he was in actually himself in the process of moving to London mm-hmm. and to head up the department. Oh, for universal production music, which is, you know, the library music side of things mm. uh, over in London. And I didn't hear from him for a long time, obviously because he was busy with what he was doing. Mm-hmm. But I think it was like a year and a half later, maybe. And by this, this was by this time, I was now had the had gone through the breakup, had done all the traveling, blah, 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 was, and then had been working at Bose for six months or so and that was when he messaged me and was like hey i'd like to get you get some demos from you on this thing and i went oh i'd totally forgotten about you um (laughs) i thought that this was i thought that was basically just like uh here's my card and never hear from you again which that happens yeah yeah so he had a he had a project for me to write some production music for um and you know they really liked my stuff and then they asked me to do more stuff um 
And that's where it sort of started from. And then I knew that I wanted to travel and sort of see Europe and go overseas. And I had let him know, oh, hey, I'm I'm thinking about coming up. I was wanting to actually move to Edinburgh because mm. I love Edinburgh. I really love the city. And I still haven't I, been. I'm really oh, hoping to visit one day. <laughs> oh, you have to go. You have to go. Um, obviously not right now because of coronavirus. Yeah, it'll but be a little while. <laughs> it'll, be a, yeah, it'll be a little while. Um, but uh, it's just one of my favorite cities. Uh, and I let him know that I was doing that. And he was like, why are you doing that? Come to London. I'll mentor you. <laughs> wow. Oh, uh, uh, okay. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Great. Fantastic. And so I said to my girlfriend, um, the, the, that guy that I, that I know from Universal said he'll mentor me if I go to London. And she was like, well, I guess we're going to London then. <laughs> uh, and so, well, yeah. It's been really nice to get that support because I feel like sometimes that's yes. a very scary thing if, you, if you're in a relationship to be like, I need to do this. I'd like yeah. you to come with me, but. <laughs> yeah. But we hadn't been we hadn't been dating for that long. But um, she also really wanted to travel and, and live overseas, and London was a place that she really wanted to go to because she's really into theatre. Um, mm-hmm. So she, in, you know, she got a job working at some theatres there. So that worked out well for her as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was fortuitous um, as well. Um, and then during that time that I was there and I was working with him, um, he he had left his position and he was Mm. kind of starting up his own thing. And then, and then he got a, a job heading up a small indie company, which is where I work now. Um, Oh, nice. Yeah. Felt music. Mm. They're, um, it's, it's a great little, uh, company. They're actually not that little, um, comparatively for an, for an indie, you Mm. know, there's, there's quite, it's quite a, quite a, um, sizable production library. Um, and they're all really lovely there. Um, but I got a job there through, through him as an, as an intern. Yeah. Um, and then, and that was when I was working at, uh, at Bose on Regent street, you know, yeah. a few days a week. And then, then, then I was doing a few days there, um, you know, pretty much unpaid mm-hmm. and they were paying for my expenses for like travel and food and stuff. But, uh, yeah, that was, that was a difficult time because I was paying rent in London. I was living in Ealing. Yes. I, was, I had like a three day a week income and then I was doing the rest of the time as an intern. Um, yeah, but- I can't imagine that was easy because, of course, uh, I don't know, I guess as an intern, what were you kind of doing day to day whilst you were interning there? It was a lot of um, metadata work. And metadata is like the um, the sheet of information like a spreadsheet that has everything that pertains to every track so mm-hmm. um you know track all the number, track information artist, tra- composer yep. composer like- what what this what their split is um mm. if there are multiple composers who the publisher is and tag words mm-hmm. so you have to t- tag the music with with uh you know mood words mm-hmm. instrumentation and as there's a lot involved in that. So I was doing quite a lot of data processing as an intern, mm. but by being there in the room, I had the opportunity to start writing for some ad pitches that would come in because they have a supervision team there as well. that are really good. Mm. Um, and they, you know, there's, you know, constantly things going on in the, in the room. Um, and just by, by being in the room, um, I could kind of be like, hey, Oh, I could, I, I could have a go at that and mm. just, you know, do, do a few ad pitches and just, um, you know, over over time, they they kind of get to know what your sound is like and what your quality is like and what you like to work with. And being being easy to work with is is a really important thing if you're a composer. Yeah. Um. And uh, I my 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 pop used to say that you should play every gig like it's worth a million bucks, and that was his attitude towards. So he would play big huge stage gigs and then he'd play like little tiny gigs but he would play the same every time yeah i mean Uh, i can definitely see that in sort of your philosophy because even uh sort of on the shop floor at bows you would uh you know you'd like mention a little bit about how uh it's a little bit tiring (laughs) doing all these (laughs) things that you're doing and yet you were just like 
shining on the shop floor with enthusiasm and uh, <laughs> life, which I was I was very impressed by. Um, oh, thanks. Yeah, and I. Um, but yeah, I can't imagine that was easy because that's a lot of things to juggle. Um, how did you yeah. manage uh, kind of to do? I, I imagine you kind of had your own projects that you were working on, little things that you were doing on the side for yourself at the time as well. Did you manage to find time for those? Yes and no. Um, what I was what I was doing on the side was teaching myself about interactive music and how to write music for the interactive media. So mm. I was uh, learning about a uh, software called Wise, which mm -hmm. is middleware. So it's pretty much the the tool that you use to take music and say, okay, how is this music going to transition mm -hmm. from one piece to another, or even within the same piece of music, because typically you'll break it down into parts and, you know, like if you have like some tense tension music in a game, it has to be broken down into the different layers so that as it gets more tense, it, you know, those other bits can, can fade in and yeah. you know, stuff like that. So learning, I was teaching myself how to, how to use that. Um, I was learning how to use Unreal Engine mm -hmm. 4 so that I could get, uh, you know, an understanding of, of what was going to, what needed to happen to the music in order to get it to the final stage. Um, and, and that took up quite a lot of time. Um, otherwise I was getting, I was getting pitches for, for ads fairly regularly at the mm -hmm. time. So there was, there was usually something to work on from week to week. Um, they usually had very, very tight de deadlines. Um, yeah. so there might, they, you might get a, an ad pitch that you had to turn around, you know, the next day. But then you might get feedback from that and then turn the next one around the day after that and yeah. stuff like that. So it could be the same thing ongoing for a week, but your deadlines are constantly very, very tight. Yeah. Um, and that's fine. I like I like working under pressure. I feel like it motivates me to have a deadline like that, to have someone else say, I need this by this yeah. time. I don't know. There's something in my brain that, you know, motivation is no longer an issue. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, it just, it just needs to happen. There's no time to procrastinate or be perfectionistic yeah. about it. You have to send it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. My um, my girlfriend was very um, understanding of my, you know, stressful moments. Where I'd just be like <laughs> pacing the room, going, oh, fuck, 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 you know, and uh, it's just not, it's not working. It's not, it's not, it's terrible. It's just, I don't like it. And and she'd listen to her. Ah, oh, no, it's it's maybe you could change this a little bit here. Maybe maybe there's some things over there. I'd be like, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe it's not too bad. And I would make some changes or whatever. But um, it it happened really quickly because of the deadline that was there. Mm -hmm. So I felt like that 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 was also a really good uh, motivator to try and get stuff done. Um, yeah. <laughs> another thing that I would do would I bought I bought myself a book for arranging an orchestration. Ooh, okay. um, I, it was it was a recommendation. It was what was it called? A, a orchestration and instrumentation, I think, by Alfred Blatter. Mm. Um, it's a really really good book uh, for learning orchestration for for writing uh, for for the orchestra. Um, I mean, I, you know, I learned a lot of stuff through university and my degree and everything, of course. But it's always, I feel like it's always good to be open about learning and relearning and going over stuff that you've that you already know and just solidifying that knowledge or reminding yourself of things that you'd forgotten. Yeah. Um, which was, which was really good. And I, I, I got myself some manuscript paper and I would, I would, you know, write out my scales and my key signatures and everything mm. just to, just to sharpen those skills. And it can be boring, but it can also be therapeutic. Yeah. Like, almost like meditative because you just, mm. you know, almost it's, like it's coloring easy. in the lines kind of. Yeah. But with music. Yeah. Yeah, and that has a um, that you know just by doing that a little bit, um, either every day or every other day, it it sit, it sink it sinks in until mm. it you don't have to think about it anymore. I mean, if you forget, like, oh, that's right, what was the key signature for you know E sharp, and you, you know, oh, I can't remember. But then if you if you've been doing that, it just becomes second nature. It's um, really reassuring to hear that that's something that people practice because I uh, assume. 
a lot of the time that when people learn music theory in particular, it's almost kind of like learning a math formula. And <laughs> you just you just know it. It sits in the back of your head. Everybody knows that the Py- Pythagoras theorem is, you know, X squared plus Y squared equals Z squared. And that's it. Um, you don't need to kind of write it down again and again to practice it. But this is really yeah. nice to hear. <laughs> no, I do. I mean, I struggle with um, my memory sometimes just forgetting stuff. I forget people's names all the time. It's, <laughs> it's the worst. Um, but yeah, I do. I like practicing those little things, uh, those really basic fundamental things um, mm. from time to time. Just, just a refresh. Just yeah. a refresh. Um, that's all. You know, even I and I, I'd still forget stuff. Yeah, and that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. When exactly. you're a composer, you don't need to know it on the fly. You don't need to sight read, but it helps. Mm-hmm. I, yeah. I, <laughs> well, this is what I love about kind of technology in general. I yeah. uh, for for that university assignment where I had to write a song. Um, speaking of deadlines, um, yeah. I uh, I found it really. I kind of got over ambitious with it, which is what happens a lot of the time, which is almost always also my downfall. But oh, I no. uh, kind of. I didn't know how, to what extent you could do this successfully on Logic. I found the scoring thing, like the, where you can. Oh, yeah. Oh, and I just, I loved basically doing it all on MIDI and then printing it out as like a score. (laughs) It was beautiful. It looked like I made a completely separate new work of art that way because it just looked really beautiful. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I mean, there's so many things that you can do to to make the score look pretty yeah add random um, crescendos and <laughs> <laughs> well they have to mean something but yeah sure um get louder actually, and then qu- quieter for no reason at all <laughs> yeah. i um i i don't like using the score editor in logic i find it a little bit clunky mm. i think i think by the time you've you've got a full orchestra that you're doing things for you need a tool that is a little bit more efficient. Logic Mm -hmm. is really good for its audio production side of things. I, I don't really enjoy using its, its score editor. Um, Mm -hmm. But you know, there's other programs out there like Finale or Sibelius that you could, that are much better for preparing scores, but are not good for audio production, like actually producing something that sounds good. Um, So but yeah, yeah, you're right. It, it does look nice when you print out the thing, and you know, it's a physical thing that you can hold. And, yeah, okay. it's always really yeah. that. There's uh, very few Something ways. tangible. And, yeah, because when you make music, I, for most people these days, it's all entirely digital. You put it on Spotify, you never get to hold it. Um, yeah. But yeah. Certainly so. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's. Uh, when I first started the podcast, I was kind of. Uh, very conscious in that I kind of wanted it to be an escape, but uh, for people as if it, as if it didn't exist, but that is completely impossible because it's impacted everybody, literally yeah. everybody in the world. Yeah, actually, that's an interesting thing to talk about um, because a lot of the, you see you see a lot of people on like social media and stuff pushing uh, people that, that now is the time. You know, you have to get motivated and get creative, and you got to really you know, soak up this time. And there's a lot of people, I think, feeling pressured, like, like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm really bad because I should be, you know, really productive at this mm-hmm. time because now I've finally got the time. Um, and I think that at the beginning I was productive, mm-hmm. um, but then very gradually became very unproductive and found it very difficult to deal with just the fact that I was, just the fact I was inside all the time yeah. Um, yep, yep. And the depression of just the whole world basically just suffering. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I had to stop looking at the news because it was too much. Because mm-hmm. it was too much bad, like really big news, bad big news just all yep. the time. It was yep. constantly new records being set of you know, people dying and, and like all this. It was just, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's really, it's a lot. And it was just... Uh, really, really depressing, and it, it's hard to be in that headspace and then go. Okay, I'm going to sit down and create something. Mm. <laughs> I think it's air. also really weird from that perspective. If you manage to uh, be creative, and if you're making some like a kind of product 
uh, whether it's art or music or film or um, like something sculptural, clay or earrings or jewelry, whatever, anything. And to kind of convince people to spend whatever money they have on your thing, I think it's it's such a it, it's very interesting to strike a balance of like please buy my thing, but also I know you might be in the situation that I'm in or like worse off or better off, in which case you can't even, you know, I can't say, wow, like, oh, thank you for spending this much money with me because it might make other people feel sad that they don't have it. And it, it, it's such a minefield. Um, people who have things to celebrate can't celebrate. People mm-hmm. who feel sad about their situation can't be sad about it and commiserate with other people who feel the same way because everyone's trying to strike this very odd balance of not too happy and not too sad. <laughs> it's impossible. Yeah. You're just in this constant melancholy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I managed to be productive. All things considered, I felt, but stuff, stuff like what you just said, you know, big marketing and, mm-hmm. um, uh, Pushing is pushing your uh, your brand and yourself, you know, to get out there and everything like that. I'd really, I really didn't do any any of that. It brought me no joy to do it, and yeah. I just felt I just I you know, and maybe and maybe it's an excuse. Or I know there's people out there to be like, no, nah, that's nonsense. You, you need to be you need to be <laughs> on all the time, or else it doesn't work. But um, I just can't do that. I. I, uh, I especially, especially during the coronavirus pandemic, that was just, I don't know. I, I didn't have the energy left. No, it does take, <laughs> it takes a lot. And I think some people that, that were, don't inherently act that way or, or kind of advocate for their own work or like it, it takes, it's an entirely different skill set for one, but also it just takes it. it it, I feel like it's a completely different part of your brain. Um, uh, Alex, my fiance, is a writer as well as a musician. And I feel like this is, uh, he's not here. This would be good for him to. <laughs> but yeah. We have a whole podcast episode. It's episode two where uh, we mm. kind of talk about um, sharing your work and really like advocating for it. And this is something that I championed for him and but basically everybody. Um, he, It feels harsh to say it this way, but I haven't found a better way to articulate it. It feels like you may be doing a disservice to your really, really brilliant work not to scream and shout about it. But I can also empathize with the fact that to be that person amongst your kind of community or group of friends or anything like that. It's like, hello, I made a new thing again. Hi, I made a new thing again. Please look at my thing. (laughs) It's, It's always... Oh, it's, um, I can understand that it's difficult, but I feel like there's no other way to get other people who might be interested to find it if it's not out there. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, I think it, it can depend on what you're, where you're trying to sell yourself to as well. Like if you're trying to get a publisher to Mm -hmm. like your stuff, um, the best recommendation will come from someone else probably. Yeah. They'll, cause they'll get they'll get so many people um, like we get loads of submissions at felt mm-hmm. all the time of composers saying, Hey, here's, this is me and this is my stuff. Um, please have a listen. I'd love to work with you. Stuff like that. And um, you know, I encourage everybody to, to, to do that and be proactive because it does, it does make a difference. We do listen to them. We don't, we don't always have time to listen to all of it. Yeah. So, you know, you have to be, concise as Mm -hmm. concise as possible and you know you said you mentioned scream and shout about your your stuff we 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 do we we can tell if somebody's you know a bit over the top yes we do we do appreciate people who clearly know that what they're doing is good so they're they're not saying i'm an amazing composer and i will i will write music that will make you money you know yeah we're not looking for that (laughs) <laughs> um, but the guys, but the guys that that are, I guess, quietly confident, and we listen to the music and go, "Yep, that matches up. This could be, this could be something." And if we don't have anything in in the pipeline that suits the style, um, 
we we do make a note of them and、mm-hmm. um, try to get、uh, get them onto things that that might suit them.、Um, I think a lot of people struggle with what, how, like how to compartmentalize their styles,、um, yeah. And and you do you you do get letterboxed,、um, and it's kind of something that's really hard to avoid、um, because. Even just when you're,、uh, you know, I, I do lots of things. You know, I do mostly orchestral things, but I, I'm perfectly good at a lot of contemporary stuff, electronic thing. I can I can do that as well. Yeah. Um, but I have to push myself as the orchestral guy, the guy that is really good at the orchestra and、uh, like cl- I'm a tr- classically trained composer.、Mm-hmm. Um, and you and you have to really kind of push that because that's how you get in. Yeah. Uh, because it's it's it, when you've got so many composers to to kind of try and think of when you get a project that you know might suit people like for for the supervisors when they get an ad that comes in they have to think okay who's going to be good for this yeah they they're not going to go okay you know John is really good at all of these all these different he's basically good at everything、mm-hmm. um, they're not gonna they're not gonna Think of him that way, unless they've been working with him for a long time, yeah, and r- are really confident that he definitely can pretty much do anything. But he would have got in by having a single thing that he's good at, yeah. And they can go, oh, this is a contemporary thing. Let's, I know this guy's really good at that.、Mm. Um, It helps and- people like put you as the top of mind for a particular thing, and that's、yeah. a lot easier than. Um, un- unless that's something in particular that they're looking for, I guess then it's、mm. a little bit more difficult to be like, oh well, these five people do literally everything.、Yeah. If, if, if you've got a project and you're looking for something in particular, why would you look for somebody who can do everything when you have an expert at something else that you're actually、exactly. looking for? So if you if you get a a, a thing that comes in where you know you'd really want a, an orchestral. Production.、Um, if you've got somebody who specializes in that, and that is their thing, you're more likely to. They're more likely to go. Let's get that guy、mm-hmm. on it. They'll usually get a few people to 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 put to submit demos in. So you know,、yeah. some people get get to have a go at some other stuff. But if you've been working with them for You know, like a couple of years, and they know that you're really easy to work with, and you always, you know, are on time with your deliveries, and it's always really high quality stuff.、Mm-hmm. You know, then is th- that's a good time to be like, by the way, I can also do this. Yeah, check out some of that because you've got that rapport now.、Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, next time they get something in, it might be a fusion thing where they be like, okay, that's like a a fusion of. You know, orchestral and electronic stuff. So it's like trailer things. You're like, you know what? Let's 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 give him a go with that,、mm-hmm. where they may not have asked him before because they would have thought, oh, he's the orchestral guy. But this also has an electronic element, so we're not、yeah. going to get him. You know, that can happen.、Mm-hmm. It's just about staying in the forefront of people's mind and 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 making them want to, you know, want、like, to pick pick you. you for the thing. Yeah, yeah that's right. And I think it's quite interesting that.、Um, Well, this、uh, I kind of heard something similar in terms of like the social aspect of this、um, of just working in a creative industry with、um, I think they mention it in the the six figure home studio podcast,、um, which is lovely if you're you're、um, kind of into、that. mixing and mastering. It's so good. It's、um, I I'm definitely out of my depth with that side of <laughs> music and music making, but、uh, it's very interesting to listen to.、Um, And one thing that they mentioned is that even if you are very, very good, like let's say you're an expert in a particular thing, if you're a little bit easier to work with than somebody else who's maybe not as good and needs a little bit more direction and guidance, then you're kind of top of mind in that way as well because you want to work with somebody who's easier and is more perceptive and、uh, mm. more receptive to feedback, basically. And、um, yeah. that's something I think that people miss out when they are. Really working on honing and their craft and their skill. Yes, I, I, I、uh, another thing that my my grandfather was really well known for was being really easy to work with. He always showed up early、mm-hmm. to a gig, 
He was always well rehearsed and he always was fun to hang out with because he was, you know, he's a funny guy. So yeah, uh, people enjoyed his company. Um, and that's, that's, that was important too for that social aspect. And, and yeah, I try to, I try to bring that into my whole mindset whenever I'm doing a job is, you know, I'm, it's, it's, it, I have to be pleasant to deal with in order for them to want to deal with me again in the future. Yeah. Um, and, and as little work for them as possible. I don't want them to have to, um, you know, babysit me. Yeah. Um, or get me to like redo stuff because of a stupid mistake or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. or, or like even just delivering the, the, like the products to them and be like, here, here are the, um, here are the files. I ask them, what format do you want it in? How do yeah. you want them to be labeled? Mm -hmm. and, and I will be very particular about making sure that it follows the exact naming um, scheme that they want it in. So they want it to be, you know, like felt music underscore the, the brand name underscore blah, blah, blah. And make sure that I get all those in the right order. So being very particular about that kind of to that level where yeah. I go, oh, it's so easy. But then you, I get the thing from Blake and then. Mm -hmm. It's exactly how I want it, and I just have to upload it to where it needs to go to give to the client or or whatever. So, you know, that when I say easy to work with, it's that it's that 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 level as well. Because mm -hmm. um, that that stuff makes a difference to their day to day. Because they, they they get sometimes they get composers that will start, submit um, stuff, you know, one by one yeah. in in, a, in an email, and it'll just be named, you know, version two. Yeah. Five different and attachments that, on two different yeah. emails, and if it's a big, if it's a big um, project, they might have quite a lot of composers on it. You know, like up to ten mm. to submit demos, and you might have to submit a couple of different versions. And by the time they get everybody's stuff in, um, they don't want to have to be digging through their emails for where 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 that last version was or put them all into a file and go, okay, whose was, whose was whose? Yeah. What, who, whose, whose was this one? You know, um, by making it super easy for them just in their day-to-day -day stuff, then that, that also adds to them wanting to, you know, work with me again, I think. Mm. You were talking about honing your craft and people that would be receptive to feedback. I'm very, um, mm -hmm. very receptive to feedback, as you know, from, from working at Bones. <laughs> I think sometimes um, it, it was almost a little intimidating for me because I was like, uh, well, I don't know. You, well, I think you, you came from a more senior position than I was in at the time. So I was like, mm. it felt weird giving you feedback <laughs> on something that you knew so well. <laughs> well being really open to, to, to learning new skills in like sales and mm -hmm. uh, all that kind of personal development that I went through with, with them um helped me with you know being open and and having that kind of same approach in in my music um profession i think i think pretty much everything that i did you know uh working in retail and stuff that it carries over it, it yeah. all carries over um selling skills is a big one that yes. that makes that made a big difference in my like confidence mm -hmm. when when just talking to people um, mm -hmm. like just be, being given that exposure of having to deal with strangers yeah. and have, have to try and sell them a product. But, uh, because of the environment I was in there, they were very particular about, you know, how you sell a product in a yes. positive way and stuff like that. Uh, that, that really helped a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, and kind of viewing, viewing the music that I make as a product rather than like a personal thing that I get super personally attached to. I think that also makes a big difference when receiving feedback on it. Yes. Um, yeah. I watched, I watched a, um, there was a live AMA with the composer who did the music for the Queen's Gambit. Oh yeah. Yeah. But, um, uh, his name is Carlos Rafael Rivera. I think, um, soundtrack was, yeah, I looked it up because I forgot his name. But, <laughs> yeah. Right. I'm pretty sure that's right. Um, and what he said really resonated with me where he said that he views his 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 job more similar to a carpenter rather mm -hmm. than say an artist like a painter or something mm -hmm. um he has a job to do 
mm-hmm. he gets a customer that says, I want a table. Mm-hmm. He doesn't get to tell them what kind of table they are going to get. Yeah. You know, he has to listen to the customer and understand what what kind of table they want. Mm-hmm. It, you're, mm-hmm. you're creating a thing for someone else. And you can take pride in the thing that you make. Like, I definitely take pride in everything that I make, but I don't get precious about it because it's not my table. Yeah. And that really resonated with me. Um and I, th- I think that is that that is how I kind of approach it, and it helps with the whole uh, selling things. I mean, you remember from like bows and everything. You're asking the questions of trying yep, to find yep. the right product for the person. You know that all those skills translate to trying to find out what the right sound is mm-hmm. for what 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 is it that they're looking for, and 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 trying to interpret uh, their ideas for their vision and stuff. I make it make it all about trying to satisfy what it is that they want for yeah. their vision that's not it's not my vision i have input creative input and you know ideas and things but it's not mine mm-hmm. um and having having that approach really really made it easy when you know i send something off i won't say easy easier yeah um less less soul crushing yes you send, send something <laughs> Send something that I've created for a ad pitch where, you know, it just falls flat. And I go, yeah, it's not, doesn't work. It's not what we want. And I would Mm -hmm. look at, look at it and go, it does work. It does work. But the problem is that, you know, it works for what, what is in my head, but it's not what works for them in their head, which means I just need to be better at getting feedback from them and understanding what it is that they want. So it means that there's been a miscommunication or a breakdown in communication somewhere. And so that, Feedback needs to come through and and sometimes they'd be hesitant to give it because they don't want to, you know, crush you. Yeah. So sometimes you have to be like, hit hit me, hit me with it. Mm-hmm. Hit me as hard as you. It's almost like if you ask for it, uh, it's it's less soul crushing when they do give it to you because you're like, yeah. well, I, I, I asked for this myself. And I was like, hit, yeah, hit me as hard as you can. you've braced yourself for it. Yeah. So you, you've yeah. prepared. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want to, I want to know how can I make this, how can I make this. How can I make this the right product for you? <laughs> oh yeah. God, I do miss working in retail sometimes. <laughs> oh, but um, um, yeah, I think it's it's learning to let go of your work is uh, more important than I ever thought. I thought that uh, for a long time that if you if you let go of your work, whether it was to receive feedback or just to like say that this is it, this is done now. Um, mm that was in some way betraying it because it wasn't your baby anymore. Mm. (laughs) Um, But realize even, even in, (laughs) not that I know anything about parenting, but you do eventually also have (laughs) to let your kids do whatever they do and because they're going to grow up and do whatever. And uh, in some ways, so is your creative work because after you kind of let it go out uh, into the world yeah. You don't have a choice in what happens to it to some extent because people will like take yeah. it and interpret it. And, and if it goes, if somebody takes a particularly, um, uh, if someone takes a particular interest in it, they might take it and make it their own somehow, which, you know, yeah. doesn't, does or doesn't enhance or retract <laughs> from what you're trying to do. And it's uh, very overwhelming what? to think about if you let it take you. <laughs> yeah. Li- library, library music and like production music uh, can be very interesting for that because um, if you have an account on say something like TuneSat, I don't know mm. if you've heard of that, where you can upload your track and it will monitor kind of different areas for where the music is being used and it'll kind of give you an idea of where it's been used, you know. Mm. Um, yeah, you, you really see some odd placements. <laughs> oh. oh, I never really saw it that way but okay um Mm -hmm. yeah i did i did do some uh trailer music and it got used in some uh, i think it was like a crime documentary in uh france oh wow yeah and i looked it up and i like listened to the and and they just used like a section of it like a like a like a like a part of it yeah and i went oh there it is oh weird that's that's (laughs) that's so weird (laughs) Like seeing it through somebody else's eyes for a completely different context. So weird yeah, sometimes. But but so different to, you know, if you get uh if you get a, 
a, a thing that you have to write music to, you know, like an ad or, a, or mm-hmm. you know, a show or something, you know, you know where it's being used and you can see how it interacts with uh, what's on screen. Whereas when you get some of those like random placements and then you go and look <laughs> at it, you, you have no idea how how they have interpreted your music in terms of like how it interacts with what's on screen. So it's kind of interesting to see how other people use your music. So much to to talk about. I feel like we could go on for forever, but it's been a little while now, so maybe we should wrap up. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, I think that library music is a or, or production music is a good avenue to to try and pursue as somebody who's getting started um, and doesn't really know what to do with the music or or whatever. Just make make some music as best you can, and you know, put it on SoundCloud. Make a nice artwork for it. Turn it into a some kind of album, and just send it to like mm-hmm. look up look up production music companies and send it to them and see if somebody like send it to as many as you can, mm-hmm. and maybe you'll get one that says yeah we might we might sign this into the library and then you know all of a sudden it's published somewhere and I mean it might not make any money, but yeah. you you'll have achieved like a little small goal there with get if you get some some music out there. Um, I feel like that's a a good little achievable goal, something that you can work on, you know, at at home. Just do it yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, these days, music is very easy to distribute, and if you don't know how to, it's very easy to Google and find out, and you can do it for free. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> this didn't used to happen. Uh, even as as early as forty years ago. 20 years ago even <laughs> yeah and and some of the music that that get ends up on some production music libraries you know they're not amazing quality productions or whatever they just they kind of they they find their niche and they get used on things you know some some of the the weirdest music gets placements and like big placements occasionally where they go wow they've just made a lot of money out of a drone <laughs> you know I think that's one of the best sell. That's one of the like the highest earners in the the production music library in, in Universal is is a drone because um, it just got used on loads of things. It's just because it because it goes for so long and they mm-hmm. they put it in the background of things like TV shows and stuff. And then that it's like you paid per minute, so you <laughs> you can't make a lot of money through that. That's fair. Wow. So it's yeah. Don't be uh, intimidated or afraid mm. to pursue that. Hey, that's a that, that, very good advice. Uh, get started with whatever you have um, yep. and go for it as much as possible. Yeah. I'm also talking to myself when I'm saying all this. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Uh, cool. Well, thank you a huge, huge and immense amount. It was a massive pleasure talking to you about all this. Um, and uh, I really pre- appreciate you getting up early in the morning to have this conversation. <laughs> yeah, get, get really early at 8 a.m., yeah. Well, I mean, everybody's sleep schedule is different, so. <laughs> everybody's sleep schedule is different, yeah, you're right. Um, but, yeah, uh, again, yeah, thank you very much. And um, and thank you for all your words of advice. Um, That's okay. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. It's been really fun. Yay! If you'd like to find some of Blake's work, you can find it on BlakeReginaldBennett.com. That is Blake Reginald and then Bennett with two N's and two T's dot com. I have been Nancy Art Music. You can follow me on TikTok and Instagram at Nancy Art Music. Alex, where can we find you? I'm Alex Roberts and you can find me on Instagram at Alex Roberts Writer, and you can find my first collection of poetry, Empire, on Amazon. 